Okay, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for attending the first virtual ICAR and participating in the 40 or so sessions that have already taken place. My name is Joanna Friesner. I'm the executive director of the NASC nonprofit charity that serves as the organizing committee for this meeting. And I'm also the lead organizer of the conference. Many people in the global community have participated in developing the program. It was not an effort just by us for sure. I know I can speak for everyone on NASC when I say we are thrilled to see the meeting come to fruition this week. I also want to acknowledge the many AV professionals who have been working very hard behind the scenes all week to produce the conference, bring in speakers from all over the globe and make sure that the discussions have been successful. Um, I certainly know that their efforts are greater than when we all can be in a room and just walk in after having finished our PowerPoint on the flight before and just start talking. So they make everything behind the scenes look fairly easy, but I know what they're doing and I acknowledge that. We also really appreciate the many session speakers and all the effort they have put in to participate in the sessions. They've been engaging with an audience of about a thousand participants from all over the world, which is an amazing turnout. And we are thrilled that a virtual conference has allowed more access to more people. In just a moment, I'll be turning over the meeting to the members of the NASC that uh, should be shown up on the screen, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, I'll be monitoring the chat to see if there's anything I can answer. And if I can't get to it due to time, I will see if we can follow up later on. One last note is you may have noticed this week that we have been asking the session chairs to prioritize questions from early career attendees, including students and postdocs. And for the times that we have in this session to talk, we will follow the same approach. And again, if we can't get to all the questions, I'll, I will personally try to follow up with you later on. So now I will turn the rest of this town hall over to members of NASC, starting with Roger Innes. Thanks, Joanna. Um, this has been an amazing effort from you especially, but um, just seeing the history of this meeting, I think everybody knows this was meant to be face-to-face -face in 2020. We had the whole program planned, done a lot of groundwork that I'll go over in just a minute here to put the meeting together. And then suddenly we had to postpone for a year. We thought it was still gonna be face-to-face. -face. And then last October had to make the difficult decision of switching to a virtual format. And anybody who thinks virtual meetings are easy and should be free to watch, um, that is absolutely not the case when we learn what it takes behind the scenes to put on a virtual meeting. But I, I think Joanne has done an incredible job of recreating as much as you possibly can in a virtual format, um, a true meeting experience. And I've really been enjoying the sessions, the talks, the questions and answers. I think this has all gone amazingly well. So on behalf of NASC, Joanna, thank you for your incredible efforts to make this happen. So a little bit more about NASC. Um, I've been I've had the pleasure, privilege of being on NASC for the last five years. This is actually my last year. Um, the way you get on NASC is to be nominated by somebody in the Arabidopsis community. It can be yourself. And then there's simply a election held. But the key aspect of that process now is people willing to serve need to write a short statement on why they'd like to serve and what they see contributing to the Arabidopsis community. And I think having that brief statement has really allowed us to elect um, people who are really motivated to work on behalf of the Rabbit Optus community to make this meeting happen in North America every three years, um, but also to think about what other resources the Rabbit Optus community needs, communicate with federal um, funding agencies, um, generally raise money, and just do a lot of planning to make sure that the Arabidopsis research community is gonna flourish. So if you have any interest in contributing to the community, um, please put yourself forward um, in the election this coming fall um, to be elected and serve on NASC for a five-year term and get heavily involved in planning the next ICAR. And that's, you'll hear more about that at the end of this 
this workshop. Um, <clears throat> so I said a few of these things, the, the main jobs to mask is planning, running, and fundraising for the iCards. And fundraising, I should emphasize, because we've had tremendous support to help pay for people to attend this meeting that otherwise wouldn't be able to attend. Um, <clears throat> So I covered all that, so I'll just keep going on. So the election is done through the electronic secret ballot. And so we really hope that there'll be many people nominated and step forward and we'll be electing two new members um, in the, this fall. Okay, so you probably know this ICAR is very different than previous ones, but it's not just because it was virtual, it's because we really changed our approach to how we organize the meeting. So in 2017, the way we organized it was um, what I would call a very traditional way of organizing meetings. I've been involved in planning several meetings over my career. And the typical way is that the meeting organizers, a group of scientists, typically small group, um, thinks of people that would give good talks, they invite them, and then they give their talks. But what that means is it's really not very representative of the entire community. It's really who knows the five or six organizers in the meeting. And that's pretty much what would happen in 2017. The MASC members came up with the speakers and the organizers of the mini symposium. Um, <clears throat> as a result of that, um, it's probably not as diverse topic-wise and not as diverse people-wise as it could be. Um, 2017 was not a huge success for ICAR as far as number of attendees go. I think we had only around 500 total, so half of what we're getting for this meeting this year. And so the NASC decided we needed to change our approach. And so we did that. Um, <clears throat> I need to close the chat so I can actually see the slides here. So we decided we need to be more responsive to community priorities and develop a program that better served the community needs and priorities. And so the first thing we did actually was put together an external advisory board so we could get more input than from just the members of NASC. And so Blake Myers very graciously agreed to chair that board. He was a formal, former NASC member. And here you can see the names of the people that served on that external advisory board. This is back in 2017, 2018. They provided a lot of useful input to NASC. Um, and the recommendations that came out of that was to develop new session combinations rather than trying to silo things into very traditional topics, organize around bigger mechanistic questions, have themes that address major questions and how models are tackling them, and especially diversify speakers and sessions and engage non-traditional speakers, especially more early career folks. And then finally, bounce fundamental discoveries with work that showcases applied research. As you all know, many of the foundational discoveries made in our Avidopsis are now being applied in agriculture. And we wanted to highlight some of that. We also did a community survey. So many of you attending this meeting responded to that survey. And I think what you're seeing in this meeting is a large result of the feedback we got. We got 693 responses, which is really um, an amazing response rate for these sorts of surveys. Um, so top priorities that came from community feedback were opportunities to present a talk. And certainly there's been a lot of opportunities at this meeting with over 300 talks. Um, diversify the speakers and topics. And especially get more speakers that are beyond the names that we often saw at every ICAR meeting. <clears throat> So to come up with our invited speaker list, especially for the plenaries, um, started with that community survey input. We asked for input from the community on who plenary speakers should be, and also from the external advisory board. We also surveyed recent publications for exciting research and prioritized those that hadn't talked at previous ICARs or ASPB conferences. So Joanna is a master of spreadsheets and she had a great spreadsheet showing all of this information that we could evaluate. And then one thing I really want to point out is members of NASC have developed this diversify plant science list of potential speakers. And this is a fantastic list of people who have self-identified as um, ways they contribute to diversity in the sciences. And 
I would urge you to go look at that list when you're trying to think of who to invite for a seminar at your next meeting or your next seminar in your department. So based on its input, we radically revamped the program. Um, we said we got nominations for speakers, um, chose those with diversity in mind. And also for the plenary speakers, we really wanted to pick the most exciting science for those plenaries. And so the first thing we actually did is identify the exciting science, get our list of speakers that way, and then organize themes around those speakers rather than the reverse. Because oftentimes meetings, you think of a topic and then try to find speakers to fit that topic. We flipped that. Um, we solicited many symposium topics from the community and then selected many symposiums based on that input. And then the people who submitted those ideas were, were chaired those mini symposium se sessions. And we designated a minimum of one fourth of mini symposium organizers to be either grad students or postdocs. So really bringing in early career researchers to that process. And if you've looked at that entire list of mini symposiums, which are listed here, it truly is diverse in topics and a lot of exciting new directions in the plant sciences listed there. And so what was the impact? Um, I think you can see here in this table that one, we had 161 community invited speakers. 2017, we had zero. Um, <clears throat> we had a 301 speakers total this year compared to 122 in 2017. Most of those speakers were invited by the community. And then we also um, really strove for gender balance and I think we did quite well. Um, ended up at 131 female speakers, 111 male, and then uh, a few non-binary and preferred not to say. So certainly you cannot say we are a male dominated conference this year. And also we diversified career stages, postdocs and students for 40% of speakers senior faculty only 26%. So that's definitely a change from previous mini symposia. And from here, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Anna and I'll stop sharing and let her share so she can use the pointer. Um, you, well, I don't have a load of this presentation so you can go ahead and continue sharing yours and- Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> I don't have it uploaded. I assume that somebody else is going to progress the slides. Perfect. So if you can move on to the next slide, please. Yeah. Perfect. So um, I'm going to continue about the statistics, uh, talking about the statistics. Um, a good gender balance is also seen um, in the list of invited speakers at ICAR 2021. We have a 48 to 52 split of males um, to females and one invited speakers at this ICAR. And historically, the average of NASC organized on ICARs is much closer to a 50-50 split than that of non-NASC organized ICARs that average at only 26% of female speakers, which is probably something to take note of for future ICARs. Next slide, please. Importantly, there's also a good gender balance and career stage representation among this year's conference attendees. The breakdown by gender shown on the, if you can show the panels, please. Progress to the next two, yeah. Uh, the breakdown by gender shown on the right panel is 51 females to 44% males and 1% non-binary with additional 5% not disclosing their gender. And career stage-wise, as shown on the left panel, 30% are graduate and undergraduate students, 26% are postdocs, 36 are faculty, and 7% are folks from non-academic institutions. Um, next slide. There's um, this year's conference participants are, um, are affiliated with 250 different organizations from all over the world, with 40 different countries represented at this conference. This is 50% more greater geographic representation than prior ICARs we have had, um, with the number of countries participating in 10 prior in-person ICARs, ranging from 23 to 31 countries. Furthermore, for 61% of our participants, this is their very first ICAR, hopefully of many more to come. Next slide, please. Um, and I'd like to talk next about the efforts of the organizers um, that went into planning the first virtual ICAR. Turns out that going virtual requires similar, if not more resources um, than a regular in-person ICAR. You're probably wondering 
How come? One aspect is time. As the virtual format um, for the conference is new pretty much to all of us, speakers, attendees, and organizers, a lot more effort went into communicating. We chose to pre-record all plenary and concurrent sessions to avoid last minute technical issues, which involved much more work on the side of organizers, speakers, session chairs, and the AV crew. In fact, the organizers and staff were in data communication for months prior to this meeting about audiovisual needs, platform configuration, registration, abstract database, and so on. And speakers also required a lot more assistance on our end. Next slide, please. Cost-wise, the price tag of running a virtual meeting is very close to that of an in-person ICAR. Our budget for ICAR 2020 in Seattle, the meeting that never happened, was estimated to be about $180,000. If you can progress the slide, please. With 70,000 in facilities fees, 45,000 speaker support, 65,000 in registration and abstract database stuff charges. For comparison, for the virtual ICAR 2021, 85,000 cover the virtual platform we're using and the AV team that works tirelessly behind the scenes during the meeting, but has been working with us um, on integrating the schedule, recording plenary speakers, uploading talks, and customizing, customizing the experience for the past three months. And 65,000 went for registration and abstract database staff charges, which together with the AV and platform cost comes up to $150,000. What is not included in this total is the time Joanna Friesner, the NASC director, has put into pulling this together. Joanna is supported by an NSF grant and NASC nonprofit bank account. I want to add that our amazing Joanna has organized numerous North American hosted ICARs in prior years, but she will attest that this virtual meeting is by far that has taken the most effort and time on her end. Next slide, please. How does the registration fee of the virtual ICAR um, compare to that of an in-person meeting? Um, NASC subsidizes the cost of attendance to make the meeting more accessible and affordable. Um, and an in-person ICAR um, in 2020, we were supposed to charge $600 per participant on average with $275 of this amount going to on-site costs such as food and printed program and so on. $325 of that are supposed to go towards covering the fixed cost of the meeting that I listed on the previous slide. In comparison, the virtual meeting charges only $195 per person on average. That is all going towards expenses to run this meeting. What does this mean? Next slide, please. I'll show you the math. We raised $118,500 in registration fees, but as I just showed you, it takes 150,000 to run this meeting. So we fall 31,000 and half, 31 and a half thousand dollars short. To put it in a different way, we reduce registration fee by 68% to make the meeting more affordable, whereas our fixed cost went down only by 17%. So how do we deal with a shortfall? NASC members, past and present, apply for US federal grants. Two NSF, one USDA, and one DOE grant were awarded that cumulatively filled in some of the budget gap and in part paid the salary of the NAS coordinator, Joanna Frisner. NASC members also reached out to buy tech companies, publishers, and other organizations for financial support. Next slide, please. We're very grateful to our sponsors and exhibitors that together, together cover, covered the cost of conference participation for about 320 attendees. Um, these are the logos of wonderful organizations that made ICAR 2021 possible, NSF, DOE, USDA, the Company of Biologists, New Phytologist Foundation, International Plant Molecular Biology. Next slide, please. Frontiers in Plant Science, ABRC, TAIR, Phoenix Bioinformatics, AgriSera, Plant Journal, Riken, Bayer, Plant Direct, Plant Cell, Breath Old, Plant Physiology, Development, Plants, Plants, People, Planet, and New Phytologist Foundation. Thank you so much to all of our sponsors and exhibitors. Next slide, please. One other thing that I'd like to talk about is collecting feedback from conference participants in the form of surveys. You will each get a link to complete an anonymous online survey after the conference. Please be sure to complete it. Your input is very much appreciated. When ICAR is held overseas, NASC surveys North American participants that it funds to attend the conference elsewhere. 
We are also open to suggestions outside of typical surveys. Please feel free to email current NASC members or send a message to a general NASC email address that Joanna Friesner managers. Um, here it is, arabidopsisconference at gmail.com. You can also add your suggestions, thoughts, and criticisms at the link Joanna will post in the chat. Next slide. And finally, I want to remind everyone that NASC is here to serve the needs of the Arabidopsis community. Please remember that it takes good leadership and NASC is run by elected volunteer members, that we are a nonprofit organization that requires funding for activities, like our organization and participant support, and then it all works best when the community engages with us and gives input to activities that we then implement. I'd like to thank all present and past NASC members, which make ICAR possible, especially Joanna Friesner. And I want to thank all of you, conference speakers, sponsors, and participants for your feedback and support. And now we're going to talk about future NASC activities. But first we can um, take a few questions since we're well on time, we can take a few questions if any from the attendees uh, about what we just presented on um, this ICAR. If you have any feedback or questions or recommendations that you'd like to present now, we, we can hear from you. Maybe write it in the chat. I don't, I have to see about if I'm sharing um, audio, which I might be able to do, but are there any comments? Oh, you can raise your hand in the, okay. You can raise your hand in the Zoom call. <laughs> there is a question. Will Joanna receive an actual crown? <laughs> um, good question. We'll see. I've gotten lots of chocolate, which I would say is better than a crown. <laughs> we did That's give her too, I hope. three pounds of chocolate. Is that sort of, it was more than that, Joanna? Yes. Yeah, that's the only way you want to functions, that and the poppy. <laughs> okay, well, if there aren't any um, questions, then, oh wait, let's see, I do have a question from Geraint. Um, do you, let's see, do we let people, can we let people talk or do we just, Geraint, do you type it into the, I oh, think we people talk. Yeah, yeah there he is. Yes. Hey, hey everyone, thank you very much. Uh, no, I was just wondering who um hosted who hosted the abstract submission um stuff. I mean it, sixty five thousand dollars seems a lot of money for that. It would be great to know how why it was so much money. Right, I can right, answer, I that. Can answer so, that. So oh I'm hearing echoing. Okay. Um, it's okay, so Trent, if you could to mute yourself. yourself. Sorry, yep, yeah, I will, sorry. Yeah, thank you. So we, uh, back in 2018, when we were going to the University of Washington at Seattle, we made a contract with them to be our on-site hosts and run the meeting. So the registration uh, team and the abstract team are the same group. And I've been working with them for three years now to first create uh, the meeting for in person, which you know they would man the registration desk and they would do all the, the abstracts and they would do all the registration. Basically they do all of that. Um, and we had it ready to go and pulled the plug in March of 2020. And they agreed to continue working with us to convert to an online meeting. And that is a contract where we uh, promise them a certain amount of money per participant that registers with a minimum. Um, as you, Grant, would know for your conference, you're probably setting up contracts. So, so it's not just the abstract database, it's, the, it's basically the, the conference services team that has been doing all the work that, that goes into abstracts and registration for the last several years. And they also booked all the lodging, all the, all the dorms, everything that was ready to launch. And then we kind of pulled the plug on that. So for future people, for people that are developing conferences that already know what they're doing, such as going virtual, you, you can develop different contracts, but uh, luckily I can just put a plug, if I can put a plug in for working with nonprofit organizations like universities, 
I would just say that when we organized conferences in St. Louis, for example, we made contracts with um, a commercial hotel. And then when the registration was lower for several reasons, um, they are about 99% unwilling to negotiate contracts. If you tell them that you're gonna give them $300,000, you have to give it to them regardless of whether your attendeeship is half. What I can say is that all my times working with universities, which is most of the time we do ICAR, they are willing to renegotiate because they themselves are nonprofits. And so the University of Washington canceled all of my contracts for dorms, for food, and with zero penalties. And um, so I, if you're ever thinking of a meeting, I highly recommend you do that because there aren't clauses in their contracts for if COVID-19 or, or a travel ban from your president <laughs> prevents people from coming to your meeting. Maybe I could also say that, you know, anyone who's been involved in pivoting to a virtual conference in this uh, sort of unprecedented time has perhaps been aware of the fact that it's really complicated to try and find a company, the right company to sort of run your virtual meeting. And it is possible to do it completely by yourselves if you have, you know, like 10 Joannas <laughs> Or, you know, all of us didn't have the rest of our other jobs, I think, to do it. And, and we really considered that, you know, could we do this all by ourselves where everything was just being run through our Zoom accounts? And it would really would have been incredibly, incredibly difficult, almost impossible, I think, to have done. And Jen's pointing out in the chat, there's also crucial issues about global accessibility that we wouldn't have been able to really handle. And that's important for ICAR. So, you know, the company we have hosting this has been really incredible. We hope you've enjoyed the experience. But we imagine, of course, as virtual meetings hopefully become more popular, right, and become more common, that there's going to be more and more of a, I think, dynamic market that can help us find companies that can suit our needs um, and allow us to sort of really increase the accessibility of the meeting in terms of financial costs as well. So I just sort of point that out. Everybody doing the best that they could in this time. Um, but, you know, quick decisions have to be made too. Yeah. If there's no more questions, maybe it's time for us to switch over to the second section. So. I'm gonna share my screen and Adrian's gonna start us off and we're gonna start talking about some of the future directions um, for NASC that our community would like us to explore. So we're, again, we're not just interested in us deciding what the priorities of the community should be, we really wanna hear from you. So. Okay, thank you. As Siobhan was saying, we really want to hear from you. And what should we, what should NAS be future, focusing on for the future of our efforts? And I want to give you just a couple slides of perspective of what we've done so far so you can think about what we need to do in the future. And a lot of what we've done so far has been funded by an NSF RCN grant. So, what's an NSF RCN grant? This is the US National Science Foundation Research Coordination Network. And the goal of these grants is to advance a field or create new directions in research or education by supporting groups of investigators to communicate and coordinate their research training and education activities. Well, that's us and that's what we're trying to do. And the key is that this is how we fund NASC activities. Um, so we have to have some support to be able to do the awesome things we wanna do. The previous RCN called ART21 um, is about to expire. It was run by Siobhan Brady and Joanna Friesner. And as I was someone who was not part of this, I can say they did an absolutely amazing job. I'm gonna tell you a brief overview of it next, but we're thinking now about what we can do for the next RCN. And we really want your input right now about what we should prioritize and what ideas you have for us. And so that's what we're gonna cover in this next half hour. So just to give you a very brief overview of the previous RCN, and like, I really can't go into the details of all the amazing stuff that they did, um, but we'll just hit the highlights. 
So first of all, they uh, it focused on funding ICAR attendance and travel for students, postdocs, and early faculty. It did this through two programs, the Inclusivity Scholars Program, which is for um, underrepresented scientists, at least according to US definitions. And they did a really phenomenal job of building cohorts and community in this group. And then also early career researchers. And maybe some of you here are actually supported by this funding. Um, it supported quite a lot of members um, to attend this meeting. Okay, and then, then they also did some scientific work um, with several focus groups. There was a focus group on bioinformatics and computational biology training. And if you wanna know more, they've actually published a white paper on that in plant physiology that you can look up later to get the details of what they've done. There was a second focus group on emerging genomic techniques, and that has a white paper in Plant Direct that you can look up. And then finally, there's a focus group on broadening the impact of plant sciences through community-based innovation, evaluation, and sharing of outreach. And that um, has just had a white paper published in Plant Direct. And so like these really key things have now already been accomplished. And the question is, knowing we've done these things, what do we want to do next? And I want to give a great shout out to Siobhan Brady and Joanna Friesner for the running of this previous RCN all of this time. All right. So thanks, Adrienne. So, so yeah, so like we've been talking, uh, now we're thinking of this new RCN and trying to get input from everybody and not only the North American community, but everybody on what should be the future of our adopsis research? What should we focus not only for this RCN, but any of our you know, fights and, tri and trials to get more funding for our adopsis research? So I'm gonna ask you guys, people that are present here today, to think of two words that represent to you the future of our adopsis research. And if you could put it in the chat, we're gonna give you some time to put it in the chat. We're gonna collect these, these words later. We're gonna think through them. And just after this chat exercise, we're gonna have a few more ideas that we had already to discuss with you. So if you could put some two words in the chat of what you think should be the future of the Rhabdoptus research and community. And if you're not sure what you might want to write, if you're sort of having problems thinking, have a look at what other people are putting in the chat too for things that might stimulate your creative juices in your mind. Yeah, and just, just type whatever comes first. All right, so we'll continue to capture things that come through the chat. Um, we're gonna move on to other slides, but keep adding things to the chat as you want. And of course, you can also ask us questions uh, as we go through the presentation. So, Siobhan, thank you. Yeah, so we're gonna introduce to you guys five ideas or main topics that we've had uh, where we think we could be focusing in the future, but that doesn't mean that these should be the only five ideas at all. And after I present these five ideas, we're gonna have a poll to see which of these ideas you guys would like to chat more about today, and as well as maybe be the focus of a new RCN that we'll be writing in the fall. So the first idea is bridging the Arabidopsis and non-Arabidopsis plant research gap. And the idea here is that, you know, stop this division between are you an Arabidopsis researcher or are you a plant, you know, a crop researcher? 
The idea is to fight for funding for basic plant biology research, regardless of which organism it is. And I think that's a very important thing as we continue to promote Arabidopsis as the model plant uh, organism. Uh, the next one would be bridging the Arabidopsis and non-Arabidopsis model organism gap. And that's based on the idea that we have other model organisms, C. elegans and Drosophila and yeast. They do a lot of work together in the at least United States and the, Net, the Genetic Society of America. Uh, so we want to you know, incorporate Arabidopsis into these other societies for fighting for model organism uh, funding, which we know leads to lots of discoveries. Go ahead, Chipper. Uh, and then another idea is bridging the academia and the non-academia career gap. Uh, traditionally, we've been training, at least here in the United States and North America, students mo train students mostly for an academic job market. But not only there's not enough jobs in the academic job market, these days there's a lot of other career options. So the idea would be to think of training not only for the academic job, but for other uh, types of jobs too, including in industry and um, and you know, science communication and other things. Another idea that we had is bridging the Arabidopsis outreach gap. So it's to use outreach at all levels from high school to uh, you know, colleges, including PUIs and, and, and minority serving institutions uh, to basically have more people working on Arabidopsis research from the beginning of their careers. And that's a way of not only you know, increasing the, the value of Arabidopsis, but also increasing and growing our community as well. And finally, but certainly not less importantly, uh, bridging the inclusivity gaps within our community to make sure that Arabidopsis research is something that is available to all, regardless of race and ethnicity and gender and veteran status and whatever that is uh, within our community. So that research is available to all that are interested in and at all levels, not only at the student level, but also at the postdoc, faculty and research level in academic and non-academic institutions. So now I'll hand it over to Siobhan, which we should uh, start our poll so we all can discuss these, these ideas in more detail. So if everyone is wonderfully patient with me, I'm just gonna make sure that we have it. Okay, awesome. I am about to launch a poll. It's gonna have these five topics. Remember as Chris mentioned, these aren't exclusive. Like we would, we wanna hear more things. We're getting great ideas in the chat right now. We're gonna have more time a little bit later for even more ideas to sort of incubate. But for these particular ones, we're just interested, which of these do you think would be important? And you can, select more than one, right? So it's not just pick the one that you think is most important, it's which of the ones do you think you'd like to see us focusing on as we're building this new grant to support our future efforts for the next five years. So I'm hoping people are gonna see the poll now. And if a kind person would like to let me know in the chat that they can see it, that would be incredible. <laughs> Thank you, Liz Haswell. <laughs> And when we're done, I'm gonna share the, the results with you too. So we can see together, what do we think you know, people believe, at least you know, the 60 some people in this room think there's gonna be more opportunities for broader community to... Uh, so Yu Chen's letting me know that it doesn't seem to allow multiple choice, which is, you know, um, and Patricia also is noting that. So I'm sorry. Um, we wanted to set it up so that you could do that differently. So if you don't mind, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop this and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to look in the chat for a second and we're gonna do this a slightly different way. This is always, as everybody knows, the incredible difficulty of trying to um, <laughs> run a Zoom that you are not the architect of, but we're doing all of our best. So I'm gonna drop actually a different type of um, polling mechanism into the chat. So, and just let me go ahead and copy that link. And I think this is gonna give you, this is gonna give you an option to rank all of those things. I think it'll be a little bit better for what we wanna do. So just dropped in the chat, you're gonna open a web browser and go to menti.com. And there's a code there that you're gonna paste in. And once you do that, you'll see those same options with sliders actually, where you can say low, medium, or high importance. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna close the Zoom poll now. We'll actually just switch over to, um, the Mentimeter and I'm gonna share the screen for y'all too. 
So I'm going to switch what I am sharing and I'm going to show you the results of this Mentimeter poll as we're doing it. So as people start responding here, we're going to sort of dynamically see, don't let that influence you. <laughs> you don't have to do what everybody else is doing, just do what you think is important and we're going to see this moving. Um, There's always this thing, should you let people see it while it's happening? It'll influence their decisions. Psychology is fascinating, but thank you so much for, for thinking about this and, and letting us know how you feel about these particular aims. I can just sort of fill space. In case people haven't used it, Mentimeter is a really cool tool. <laughs> it's pretty cool um, for teaching too. So it allows for all kinds of like live feedback from people. Awesome. Probably give it just another minute. Do you think Chris and Adrian, another minute, Keith? Okay. So what we wanted, it's a race, Joanna, <laughs> who's going to win? So we don't have time to talk about all of these right now, but what we wanted to do is take um, the sort of top ones that we have time for and have a discussion with you. And, you know, we have a couple ideas for activities that could support these. But again, our sort of, you know, four to eight minds, you know, they're all right, but they're not going to have, like just us, we can't come up with the best ideas possible. That's what we need our community for, because together we're always going to come up with better ideas than just, you know, four people in a Zoom call or five in a room or eight in a room. So what we're going to do is it looks like our winners of our race today for time are going to be the Arabidopsis non-Arabidopsis plant research gap up here, and also building inclusive, bridging inclusivity gaps within our community. I would also like to note that the workshop that was run by Terry Long, Siobhan Brady, and, and Jen Nemhauser earlier this week on changing cultures and climates also did some incredible brainstorming about this last um, but incredibly important future direction. So we also have all of those ideas captured, but feel free to share more of those here too. Okay, I'm going to switch back. Thank you so much for being part of this. I'm going to switch back to our show. Okay, so what we're gonna do, if I can figure out multiple screens, here we go. Luckily, this is the first slide and it's one of our top options. So we'll talk a little bit about it. So bridging the Arabidopsis, non-Arabidopsis plant research gap. So again, these are some ideas that we thought about, um, but then we're gonna, so I'm just gonna show you really quickly and then we'll open it up and see what you think. You can put stuff in the chat. You can raise your hand and they can unmute you if you actually wanna speak. But for example, we thought, well, we could have a Arabidopsis ambassadors. So we could five, have funding, for example, to send particularly early career researchers, but not always to other conferences, right? Other plant science conferences that are not just Arabidopsis based. So sending people to the maize genomics meeting or the genetics meeting, connecting with other conferences and support for Arabidopsis speakers. So maybe we could create relationships with those groups and say, hey, um, we would like to fund an Arabidopsis speaker to come to your conference to make it more possible for them to hear about our amazing work as well. Satellite discussions during the year to bring Arabidopsis and non-Arabidopsis researchers together by topic. And again, those would most likely be community-driven topics, right? Um, technological resources for that involve Arabidopsis, but also building them beyond Arabidopsis too. Um, I, I can't see it. I have to like look around my screen. This is hilarious. Liaising with communities. <laughs> and so this is, you know, sort of, there are, are a lot of communities in the plant science world that maybe we don't do the best uh, connecting with. So for example, agriculture researchers and extension stations and things like this. So those are some of our ideas. We're wondering if y'all have any other ideas that we could be thinking about. And as Chris said earlier, you know, 
we will be paying attention, we'll be capturing the things we put in the chat. So you can sort of be brainstorming, just throwing out ideas. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be fully formed, but it'll really help us sort of directing these, this application and then these future activities that you want to see. So which of those do you like? What are new things? Liz Haswell is also saying that a lot of these approaches could be expanded to address our second topic that we had pulled for, which is the non-Arabidopsis, non-Arabidopsis model organism gap. I think that's definitely true. I suspect we're gonna weave most of these into things, but we wanna make sure that people actually care about the things that we're proposing to do also. So thank you also for pointing that out, Liz. I don't know also if other people on NASC wanna unmute, if they have some ideas that, that we haven't put on here or if they wanna I guess one comment I could add is I think we could do a better job of organizing our communications as a community. So especially now with social media and so many NAS members for that matter that are active on tweet and are doing blogs and, and various uh, audio shows. Um, maybe if we actually had a part-time paid position as you know, marketing breakthroughs in Arabidopsis research and making it accessible to a non-science public. Um, it would just raise awareness of the importance of Arabidopsis as a model system. So we just consciously paid somebody to stay on top of that is one idea. I really like that thought. In fact, we used to have this listserv, right? That's now outdated, and doesn't work anymore. But if you wanna ask your community a question, there's no easy way of really asking. You can ask through your own such social network, but you won't reach to every corner of the world. So if you're looking for a, I don't know, a mission spectra of a particular fluorescent protein that you need to find or a new mutant or something that you may not have access to, unless it's listed in tear, you don't really have access to that. So sending a note to, to the entire community and asking for a resource, maybe something is not longer, no longer available at ABRC, but somebody still has the seeds of that old line that would be great um, to put us all in touch. So this is continuing to what Roger has said. Yeah, and I, my contribution to this would be to engage also with funding agencies and revert this idea that, you know, started maybe a decade or so ago that, you know, some funding agencies are not prioritizing our abdopsis research anymore, at least here in the United States. And we all know how much science and how much basic biology has been learned through the study of Arabidopsis. So I think that, you know, this engagement with uh, the funding agencies and, and, and fight for the importance of Arabidopsis is something that we have to, to really step up. Uh, other, you know, societies, I know the NASC is not a society, it's like Joanna says, this is a charity, um, but uh, as a charity or whatever, we should engage and, and you know, visit this, this funding agencies and, and through inclusive, including, you know, these new ways of, of communicating with the, you know, our community, also communicate with these funding agencies to make sure that people understand the importance of Rabidopsis as a research model. Seeing some really amazing notes and ideas coming through the chat, also building off of these communication question uh, ideas too. So thank you so much. We're going to keep them. We're going to collate them and find a way to also communicate them back to you. Thank you so much. Um, thinking about you know the questions we ask in Arabidopsis and instead of trying to shoehorn them perhaps into non-Arabidopsis uh, contexts, we could have communication that actually helps us develop you know more integrated questions from the beginning, which I think would be really cool. Um, I'm going to go ahead for time just move us forward and show you a couple of the ideas that we had for the second highly rated topic today, which is bridging, bridging inclusivity gaps in our community. So I'm going to jump ahead in some slides because we weren't sure what you would think was important <laughs> for a discussion today. Um, and I really want to note that again, we've had really incredible um, ideas coming out of the workshop that was run earlier this week. So these are just some things that we had thought of before we also saw the incredible community ideas. So we're hoping to get more of those here today too. So building on the Inclusivity Scholars Program, expanding that to include perhaps, you know, other underrepresented groups as well, 
um, I think we're, we're quite interested also in the potential of sort of building an inclusivity scholars allies program as well. So for people learning how they can become better supporters and build a community. So it's not just on the marginalized folks themselves, um, joining and expanding on the diversified plant sciences efforts that were led by NASC members. Um, if, yeah, if you've got other things that you can think of this, we were brainstorming and we have a lot more <laughs> that we're not showing you, but what kind of things do you wanna see that'll help us make our community more inclusive, make a Arabidopsis research more accessible to everybody. And that's not just, that there's all different aspects of expanding that community, right? And also supporting that community. There's kind of a cool, like, I mean, there's an idea in the chat from Liz Haswell, which I think is, Interesting to think about. So I'm a member of NASC that's actually an ECR. And I, I, I'm i gonna say, Liz, I'm wondering if you mean ECR is actually postdoc or graduate student and not including non-tenure or pre-tenure faculty. Yeah, so I'm just checking because people have different definitions. And I think you know that would be a really amazing thing to think about making sure that we're also balancing, right? The, the workload for that person. But I think it would be, I think that's something that we should be discussing as a community for sure, because you know the voices in the room matter. It's true. And we're doing the best we can to solicit more information, right? As Roger was pointing out at the beginning, instead of making top-down decisions, we're like, let's get people's ideas <laughs> and then use that to help us make decisions. So a more democratized sort of situation, um, but having, having a voice in the room would be really important. Joanne is noting we have an ECR subcommittee, but it hasn't really taken off yet. Um, but that would really help us do that. And so if people are interested in being part of that, there's gonna be an opportunity to solicit people to be part of our early career subcommittee. I don't know if anyone else wants to unmute. <laughs> we'll have a few more minutes. I wanted to just say that I really like the idea of an early ECR person directly on the NAS committee. And the new generation seems to be much more proficient with the social media. So they would like, I don't know, not just Twitter or Facebook, but there are Slack, Discord and other platforms that an older generation may not be very comfortable with. Anna, do you want an Arabidopsis Discord? Cause I'm totally down, that sounds fun. <laughs> As a community, I haven't, I haven't used Discord, but I've used Slack. So at yeah. Slack is good. So yeah. one step at a time, Siobhan. <laughs> and we saw a, a Slack suggestion also in the chat earlier. So it seems like people are getting on board with um, communication things, communi different communication methods. There's okay. a good suggestion in the chat on support conference registration and publication. 100%, 100%, I think that would be a beautiful thing to incorporate. We're capturing all of these remembers. So you all have amazing ideas. We wanna hear them. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move us forward and um, Adrian's gonna take over because this discussion is just a primer, right? Because we don't know what we're missing. Adrian, do you wanna go ahead and I can advance for you? Or yeah, so, so the question for you all right now is what are we missing? Do you have other ideas or other themes? Um, Siobhan, if you can advance one more. Um, you know, are there themes or other activities that we should be thinking about? And please, um, right now, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll give you, I think we've got like one minute or two minutes for you to put other ideas in the chat. Um, any, you know, any other things? that maybe didn't fit within our five topics or maybe do, but expand on them. I love that people were doing that already too. Yeah, <laughs> I like coming through. I like, I like the enhanced communication ideas. I think that's a really good one. There was another comment about sort of like emerging technologies and things, which is something that's been a consistent theme for NASC RCNs throughout, throughout as well. 
So thinking about incorporating that into some of these other aims, I think will be really important for our community. So maybe I'm gonna move forward, is that okay? Cause I think it's a little, it's a bit quiet in there, so. <laughs> okay, so then um, we're, you know, this is not the end of, um, end of your participation. We'd really like to continue to hear from you. And so, first of all, you'll be receiving an after ICAR survey, as we've um, mentioned before, and we'll ask you some questions on there about, again, future directions and what you would prioritize. Uh, we also have a Google form, and please feel free to go in there and fill it out with any more ideas that you're thinking of. It's centered around what we've presented today, but you can add in more ideas there, particularly as you're thinking about things later on today, maybe tomorrow. If more ideas occur to you, please go ahead and fill them in. And then finally, you can also email us at the NASC email, so a conference at gmail.com. And you know, if, particularly if you wanna get involved, we're happy to have people uh, participate in this. That would be fantastic. So please let us know more ideas. And um, we are going to be working on this RCN application this fall, and we will be trying to incorporate as many of these ideas as we can. So thank you very much for all the fantastic ideas you've already put in the chat today. And Liz is pointing out that please join us um, for Detlef's uh, keynote address in about 30 minutes, a mutation is a mutation is a mutation. Thanks everyone for joining us, hearing about what we've been doing and how we've been changing and responding to our community. It's also your feedback. It matters because we, we listen, we respond to it. We are here to serve you. So get in it, tell us what you need, tell us what you like and what you didn't in that end of IPAR survey. And run for election in the fall. Yeah, nominate yourself, nominate people you would love to see as leaders. Um, if you're sick of seeing our faces. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Joanna, you want to say anything? Are we good to go? She can't find her unmute. And the reason I know that is because we're, we're in the same house right now. So I can hear her downstairs. <laughs> There's a really good comment from Jose Alonso mentioning that we should have an award for early career or of scientists. ASPB has lots and lots of awards, right? ICAR yeah. has never had that. And I think that's yeah. a way to, to encourage participation and then to reward participation. That's a really cool, really cool idea. Thank you, everybody. Have an amazing day. Attending. We'll see you Thanks at Deadlift Talk. Be sure to capture the chat.